Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my talk. My name is Elisa Ferreira, and I'm an assistant professor at the Kabli IPMU Institute in Japan and also at the University of Sao Paulo. The organizers from Cosmology from Home kindly asked me to give a review on ultralight dark matter models, which are this class of dark matter models that are the lightest possible candidates for the dark matter. I hope today I can give you a review of this ultralight dark matter models, explaining what I mean by ultralight, and also reviewing their rich terminology. I also want to show you the current constraints that we have in a class of these models, the fuzzy dark matter model, and show how we're narrowing down the parameter space for this model. I also want to discuss a little bit the recent advancements and also the future of this field. As we all know, um, dark matter, the evidence for dark matter is huge and coming from many different systems and many different scales. And each of those systems give us a little bit of a hint, a little bit a different property that dark matter might have. With all of those observations, plus the very precise observations from large scales, we have our standard cosmological model, the lambda SVM, where dark matter is descri described by a cold dark matter fluid. Uh, this cold dark matter fluid, uh, what we call the cold dark matter uh, model, is the current paradigm for the properties of dark matter. And in this, um, in this model, dark matter is cold, so it moves much slower than C. It's pressureless, so it clusters on, on all scales. And also it doesn't interact or interact weakly with itself or with all our visible sector. And this very simple coarse grain description of dark matter is very successful and can describe uh, the history of our universe in many different scales, like we can see here in the matter power spectrum, the matter power spectrum over wave number. And we see that the lambda CBM fits quite well uh, a wide range of observations in many different scales. However, dark matter is still weakly constrained on small scales. And this makes us wonder if the properties of dark matter are the same on small scales than they are in large scales, if they really uh, are so close to lambda CDM, to CDM. A hint of that comes from the small scale curiosities or small scale problems, which is this discrepancy that we have between the simulated CDM, the simulations of CDM alone, uh, with the observations. One example of those is a cusp core problem where in simulations of CDM, we predict that the density of dark matter should diverge towards the center of the halos, while in observations, we see that they actually have a core, so they tend to a constant density in the center. Although there is dispute about this, it is true that the behavior of dark matter on small scales is still not so well constrained. Because of that, because of all the properties that we know and also all the properties that we don't know, and mostly because we don't know the nature or the microphysics of dark matter, we have a huge amount of models of dark matter that invoke very different phenomena, physical phenomena to describe its nature. Put it simply in a mass scale, of course, those problems have all, those, those models have other properties, but putting simply on a mass scale, we can see that dark matter could be either uh, ultralight elementary particle, or something like a microscopic object like primordial black holes that have a mass of solar mass. So we have more than 80 orders of magnitude of uncertainty in what dark matter it is, which shows us that this is a very big mystery in cosmology. Today, we're going to explore one class of those models. So the lightest possible um, dark matter candidates, which are the ultra light dark matter. So what do I mean by ultralight? What, why do we go uh, so light? So first of all, what I mean by ultralight is we want particles that represent dark matter that have a mass between 10 to the minus 22 EV, which means 10 to the minus 57 kilograms, and EV, which is like 10 to the minus 35 kilograms. So those are very light particles, much lighter than the elementary particles that we know. Uh, with such a uh, small mass and large aggregation number in galaxies, those have to be bosons, and they have to be non thermally produced in the universe, otherwise they're going to be very hot today and not cold as we need to explain observations. 
And what do I gain by going to such a small masses? So why do we go to such small masses? For that, um, uh, you just have to remember the wave particle duality that we learned in our undergrad, that all the particles in the universe, they behave either as particles or as waves, or they behave as both. For example, if you get an electron that has a very tiny mass, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, this has, can be described by a wave that has a wave uh, length of 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this wave uh, is described, by, the size of this wavelength is described by the de Broglie wavelength, which is one over the mass times the velocity. So if I have a dark matter candidate that has a mass between 10 to the minus 22 EV and EV, this means that this candidate is described by a wave that has a wavelength of order of parsec to kiloparsec. This means that on scales like the size of our galaxy, uh, dark matter is actually going to behave like a wave. So if I have a wave that is around a kiloparsec scale on galaxies, uh, we're going to basically see the behavior of dark matter as a wave and not as a particle. However, when I go to large distances, this kiloparsec wave is going to look like a particle uh, point, and I recover the standard CDN paradigm. So I'm okay with all the very precise observations that we have of CDN on large scales. And this peculiar behavior in galaxies, like behaving like a wave, can give us very different um, dynamics in galaxies. Um, I said that the Toledo dark matter models can be around 10 to the minus 22 EV to EV, which is still 22 orders of magnitude in range. But in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the lightest side of this, uh, of this masses here, around 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 18 EV, because this is the, the range where we have the biggest um, uh, change in the behavior in galaxies. Because in this, with this masses, uh, dark matter has the biggest de Broglie wavelength. So this, the behavior, the phenomenology in galaxies is going to be very different. So I'm going to focus on that. And I'm only going to focus on gravitational probes. So the motivations for the ultralight dark matter model, the motivations to go to such small masses are, first of all, uh, this rich phenomenology that comes from this wave nature of dark matter but also the particles that are going to be these light particles have a very strong motivation on particle physics. Initially, when this model was proposed, one of the motivations was also to address the small scale problems. But we're going to see that this is challenging now. And as you might have seen in the literature, uh, there are many types of ultralight dark matter models. And you might have seen one of those names uh, in the literature at some point. But if you're interested in knowing what is the behavior of dark matter on small scales, we can actually divide the, all of those models in three classes. So the first class is the fuzzy dark matter model, which is basically one of those light particles under gravity, under the influence of gravity alone. We also have the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter, which is the same as the fuzzy dark matter, but if I introduce self-interaction, so if I say the dark matter is going to interact with itself. There is also a third class that is very different than this other two, which is called the dark matter superfluid. And in this class of models, the dark matter is around EV. And the behavior of dark matter is in, on small scales is actually like the one of the modified Newtonian dynamics behavior. So you can modify the dynamics inside galaxies uh, without modifying the underlying gravity theory, only modifying the behavior of dark matter. I don't have time to talk about the dark matter superfluid today, but I'll be very happy to answer questions um, when we have the discussion. So today I'm going to focus mostly, mostly on the fuzzy dark matter model because this is the most well-studied model and that we have the strongest bounds. And I'll talk a little bit about the self-interacting one. So you might know this fuzzy dark matter models by many different names, for example, wave like matter or ultra-like axions, but they all mean the same type of model. 
And the initial idea by the initial authors was that <clears throat> this was a model with a particle of the mass around 10 to the minus 22 EV. So on the lightest side of the range that I put, that could address the small scale problems. In this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on spin zero particles, uh, but to describe this bosonic particle, we could also have vectors. And there's many, there's plenty of literature on that. For the gravitational phenomenology that I'm going to talk about, much of this, of much of what I'm going to talk about is carried out from spin one to spin zero. But spin zero has the biggest amount of constraints and it is the most well studied. Uh, so I'll only focus on that here. But what are these particles that compose this ultra light black matter particle? So a natural candidate for a light scalar field, it's a pseudo normal Goldstone boson. And one of the, uh, and the most known uh, pseudo normal Goldstone bosons that we have in physics is the QCD axon which is this new particle that was introduced to solve the strong CP problem of QCD. So it has a very strong um, motivation in particle physics. Uh, but the QCD axiom uh, that solved the CP problem actually has a mass around 10 to the minus five EV or 10 to the minus six EV. So it's much heavier than what we're going to talk about here now. However, in many uh, beyond standard model particles and also in string theory, we can generate many of those uh, pseudoscalar fields uh, that we call axon light particles or ultralight axons that are uh, as light as um, we need to describe these models. And how uh, is the cosmological evolution of this? So if I want dark matter to be described by this, um, by this bosonic particle, this ultralight bosonic particle. I describe it with, as a scalar field. And I have a scalar field in a Friedman Hobson Walker background. And this is the equation of motion of this scalar field where H is the Hubble parameter. Here I chose an M square phi square potential, but all we need for this type of models it is, to, is to have a potential of this type. And the form of the potential is going to change the final equation of state for dark matter. So if I have a potential of this type, what I will have is that uh, in the early universe, the, uh, the field is ro rolling down this potential and this term is winning from this term. So the solution that I have for this equation is um, that the field is uh, frozen in, in the initial value. So this behaves like dark energy. Uh, as the universe expands and H becomes smaller, this term starts to win. So then my field starts to oscillating on the bottom of the, this potential. And then I have an effective equation of state of dark matter. And from this point on, uh, this field is behaving like dark matter. If I want dark matter, uh, if I want this field to be all the dark matter today, this transition to the oscillatory phase needs to happen before matter radiation equality. And for that to happen, the mass of this field needs to be bigger than 10 to the minus 28 QP. So this already puts a bound on the masses of the fields that we can play if we want this candidate to be 100% of dark matter. But in this talk, I'm not interested in the cosmological behavior. I'm actually interested in what happens on small scales, what happens in galaxies. And for that, the, 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 the regime that is relevant is the non relativistic regime. So we're going to take the non relativistic regime of this equation. And the non relativistic of that Planck Gordon equation is actually the Schrodinger Poisson system, where I have that the field that describes my dark matter, which is described here by Psi, is coupled to the Poisson equation. And the big phi here is actually the gravitational field. So we can already see here that dark matter is very different. The fuzzy dark matter is very different than uh, uh, CDM, warm dark matter, or even self-interacting dark matter because it is described by a Schrodinger equation or this, this gross pitaevsky equation. If I have this term, uh, this is the self-interaction, then I'll have the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter. But if G is equal to zero, I have the fuzzy dark matter. Uh, we can also rewrite those equations uh, into a hydrodynamical form by doing this Madelung transformation, where I'm going to write the field 
as an amplitude that is given by the density and the phase. Uh, and when I did that, I get that I have the system of equations, which is the continuity equation plus an Euler-like equation, which is a bottom equation here. This that differs from the known Euler equation by this term, the red term here that we call quantum pressure that counteracts gravity. This is only present in this model. So it's not present in any of CDM or dark matter or seven direct in dark matter when we describe um, this hydrodynamic work. Uh, this name quantum pressure is kind of a misnomer uh, coming from condensed matter because in our case here, we're in a completely classical system, uh, but we carry using this name for historical reasons. If I have self interactions, I might also have an extra term here, which is the interaction pressure. Um, that changes sign um, depending on the sign of the interaction. So the effect of having this quantum pressure term is that now I have something that counteracts gravity as we can see here in the fuzzy dark matter case. And when I have this, I'm going to have a point where those two are equal. So I have a hydrodynamic equilibrium and I can define my genes uh, wavelength. So below the genes wavelength, I don't have structure for, uh, uh, structure formation since quantum pressure is going to win. Um, but outside this region where gravity wins, I have uh, structure formation proceeding as normally, uh, so it reproduces CDM. So those models predict that on small scales or on scales smaller than the genes length, I'm not going to have structure formation. And for example, for the fuzzy dark matter, if I have a mass for this quasi dark matter of around 10 to the minus 22 EV, I'm going to have a genes length of order of kiloparsec. So very important for small scales or galactic scales. The story is similar if I have self-interaction, but it changes if the self-interaction is attractive or repulsive because it can help or not gravity. And I can, and this is going to tell me if I can have large or small of those regions that I don't have structure formation. Um, and the fact that I have this finite uh, genes length uh, and also this wave-like behavior give us a very rich terminology on small scales. Uh, I'm going to start describing then the suppression of small structures. So the first consequence of having this finite genes length, it is that I have a suppressor, suppression of the formation of small structure. As we can see here in simulations, this is a simulation from Simon May and collaborators from Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. And in the bottom panel, I have CDM, and on the top panel, I have fuzzy dark matter. And even by eye, we can already see that the small structures are not present in fuzzy dark matter. Uh, more uh, quantitatively, uh, we can write the power spectrum, the matter power spectrum, which I show here, the matter power spectrum over weight number. And for CDM, we predict that uh, we have structure forming on all scales. So this is a blue line. But for the fuzzy dark matter, depending on the mass of the fuzzy dark matter, I'm going to suppress the formation of structures. So I'm going to suppress power of the power spectrum on different scales, depending on the mass. However, uh, how, however powerful this uh, probe is, it is also the generate with, for example, what we have for warm dark matter. Warm dark matter is also going to suppress the formation of uh, suppressed structures on small scales, but coming from a completely different mechanism. Uh, but the effect is pretty much the same as we can see here in the transfer function. Uh, in the dotted ones are uh, warm dark matter and the solid line is quasi dark matter. And we can see here that they have a very similar behavior, although for completely different masses and also completely different um, physical reasons. But when it comes to the transfer function and the power spectrum, uh, the effect is very similar. So it's a fact that, that is very degenerate. We can also see the suppression of small structure in the halo mass function. So here I have halo mass function, and here I have the mass of the halo in solar masses. And we can see here, for example, in the gray line for a 10 to the minus 22 EV particle, we are not going to have uh, uh, the halos that are smaller than 10 to the eight solar masses. So this really predicts a very different universe than CDM. 
A second consequence of having this uh, finite size gene link of, or the suppression of structure on small scales is the formation of a silicon core. So in, uh, in the interior of galaxies, as we can see here in the simulation by Jue Chen, my collaborator, as the halo of the galaxy is forming, uh, because of this suppression of the formation of structure on small scales, we're going to form a core, as we can see here in the middle of the galaxy. This means that instead of this model, instead of this model predicting as CDN that I'm going to have the Navajo Frankie White profile. So this is density of a radius, uh, a profile that uh, diverges um, in the inner parts of the halo. This model pro uh, predicts actually that I'm going to have a chord profile. So that the profile of the galaxy is written by something like this. Uh, we can use, uh, we can try to look for those cores on galaxies. Um, and for that, we need to know how this rho C, so the density of the core behaves. And for that, we need to do simulation. And from simulations, like for, the, for example, this one from Xi, we can get this fitting function of how the core density depends on the mass of the particle and also the mass of the halo. And this is what we use to relate to observations. Uh, so, um, and here are the simulations where we can see the chord profile that uh, the fuzzy dark matter gives. So this is very important for us also to compare with observations and try to probe the mass of the fuzzy dark matter. A third class of uh, phenom uh, interesting phenomenology is wave interference, which is a direct consequence of the dark matter behaving as a wave on galactic scales. And the first one, it is in, uh, wave interference. So as this is a wave and behaves as a wave in galaxy, we are going to have wave interference. So we're going to have destructive and constructive interference patterns happening in our halo, as we can see here in the simulations, but also in these other simulations here. And we call this constructive interference uh, places where we have like order one fluctuations in density, we call them granules. And, this, uh, and we say that the halo then has this granular structure. These granules, uh, they have a, the size of order of the Debrugui wavelength. So they're pretty hard to, to see, but we're going to see that we are making advances to try to probe them. Another interesting consequence of this wave behavior is the formation of vortices. I don't have time to talk too much about it, uh, but vortices are this non-vanishing pearl uh, place sites that we have in our fluid, a consequence that the fact that this is a, a rotational fluid. Uh, and we can see them in simulations, but we also can see them theoretically. So it would be very interesting to see them in observations. A fourth class of consequences are dynamical effects. So there are many dynamical effects that those models can induce. Uh, they can induce, for example, heating and friction and which come from the, uh, from the interaction of all these astrophysical objects with the granules. So if I have, for example, a star that is much lighter than this effective mass of this granule, this star is going to get, be heated by the interaction with this granule. So uh, the this, this star or the system of star gains energy and it, um, its size um, increases. This is a very interesting probe that we can use to try to probe for the existence of these interference patterns. If those granules interact with something heavier like a globular cluster, this globular cluster loses energy and behaves differently than with what we'd expect for the CDM. So we can try to probe also this different behavior and associate this with a mass of positive dark matter. There are also other effects. One of them is relaxation, which actually is related to condensation or formation of a bose einstein condensate. And I don't have time to talk about this, but this is a still open topic. It's an open question in our literature to see if we really have a condensate um, in the center of the galaxy. And I'll be happy to answer questions about this. So given all of these predictions that we have for the behavior of fuzzy dark matter, um, uh, we should go now to observations and try to see the constraints that we can put on the mass of this, of this particle. So I present to you here uh, what I think is 
kind of up to date because really this changes every day, but I think this uh, is at least the most important constraints that we have on fuzzy dark matter to date. Uh, here is the mass of the particle and the highlighted regions are the forbidden regions for the mass. Each of those comes from a different observation or for a different probe. All of these bounds consider that all of the dark matter is made of fuzzy dark matter. So if I have another model where I have that fuzzy dark matter is only a percentage of the dark matter of the universe, those bounds are not valid, they can be relaxed. Um, so this is only if fuzzy dark matter is 100% of the dark matter in our universe. And we can see here from this um, plot uh, that we are pretty much narrowing down the mass of the fuzzy dark matter, although we present, uh, we see some incompatibilities um, here. So we can now break down a little bit of, uh, of those constraints. So the first class of constraints that I'm going to talk about are the ones that are imposed by using the suppression of the, of the small scale structures. So we can use, for example, C CMB and large scale structure to probe this suppression of the most small scale structures. So this suppression in the far spectrum, or even depending on the mass, the change in the dynamics that this field produces. So as we can see here in this plot from this work uh, from 2015 and also an update to 2018, here is the fraction of this ultralight dark matter of the fuzzy dark matter, and here is the mass. And we can see that using CMB large scale structure, uh, we can only have 100% of the dark matter being this fuzzy dark matter if the mass is bigger than 10 to the minus 24 AP. So for our uh, hypothesis that we want 100% of dark matter, the mass needs to be bigger than 10 to the minus 24 AP. Of course, if I allow fuzzy dark matter to only be part of the dark sector, part of the dark matter, um, this could have uh, smaller masses. For example, here uh, from 10 to the minus 26 until 10 to the minus 30, you can only have 10% of dark matter in our universe being made of vaccines. Uh, for masses smaller than 10 to the minus 30, this starts behaving as dark energy. I can also use Lyman alpha uh, to put constraints and those are the strongest or one of the strongest constraints that we have to date on these models. Uh, and basically, because I don't have the smaller structures in our universe, reionization is going to proceed very differently than in CDM. And you can use this uh, to ask the question, uh, what is the suppression of small structures that I can have so I have enough megaparsec scale power in the Lyman alpha force to explain the observations. And this tells us that we cannot have too much suppression. So this puts a bound that the mass of dark matter, of fuzzy dark matter is to be bigger than 10 to the minus uh, 20 EV, which is far away from the 10 to the minus 22 that uh, was first um, uh, thought of. I can also use other gravitational probes to suppress, uh, to, to probe the suppression of the small structure, like for example, stellar streams and strong lensing, as it was done in this work. Uh, by Caitlin Schultz. Or I can also use the dynamical effects like the dynamical friction in globular clusters or the heating of the Milky Way disk where because of the presence of those granules, they try to see if the disk of the Milky Way is bigger, uh, is thicker than they would expect for CDM. And this puts bounds on the mass. We can see here that the dynamical friction bound coming from these globular clusters has uh, the opposite behavior than all the other bounds. Um, and um, this remains to be studied, but dynamical friction, studying dynamical friction in those systems is very challenging. Other bounds that we can put is using black hole super radiance. So black hole super radius, it is, is this really cool phenomenon that we have that if we have those, this, um, these fields, these ultralight um, axions or axion-like particles, uh, around rotating black holes, we're going to create a cloud, a cloud of these ultralight bosons that they call these gravitational atoms. And I can use um, the, uh, the change that the presence of this cloud has in, for example, the gravitational waves or the dynamics of these uh, binary systems, for example, to put bounds um, 
on the mass on the, of these axons uh, that are, form this tunnel. And we can see here that we have bounds um, if these black holes are supermassive black holes or if they are stellar mass black holes. And those bounds are more towards the higher um, end of the mass. Um, we can also use the presence of a core to put bounds on the mass. And when we're doing this, we're basically fitting um, into those um, dwarf galaxies. We're fitting this profile, the fact that we have uh, an NFW profile in the outscores, and then we have a core. So we try to fit this numerical profile here that we see in simulations. So by using kinematic data from, for example, 18 ultra faint dwarfs, in this work, me and my collaborators, we were able to put bounds on the mass of uh, fuzzy dark matter. And we have here uh, one of the strongest bounds to date that we have on fuzzy dark matter. Here I presented a bound from SEGI-1. Uh, and we saw that um, this uh, ultra faint dwarfs, they actually prefer very small, very tiny cores. And this translates into a very heavy mass for fuzzy dark matter. So for example, from SEGI-1, fuzzy dark matter has to be around 10 to the minus 19 EV. And we see the same tendency in all the other 17 ultra faint dwarfs that we investigate. So these already showed us together with the other bounds that there is a preference for the higher mass for the fuzzy dark matter. If I do exactly the same study that I did for the ultra faint dwarfs, but for the bigger, more luminous dwarfs like Fornax and Sculptor, and try to fit this profile with the presence of a core, those systems actually prefer, prefer huge cores, uh, while the ultra faint dwarfs, they prefer tiny cores. And if you think, if you associate that this core is only because of dark matter, this gives us that they prefer a, a very small mass for the fuzzy dark matter. So to get huge cores, you have to have a very small mass for the fuzzy dark matter. So these uh, luminous dwarfs, they give like an opposite bound than the one that we have, for example, from ultra faint dwarfs, they predict really large cores. So although we're narrowing down the mass of, dark, uh, of fuzzy dark matter, we can see that there are some incompatibilities here, for example, the dwarfs and even this dynamical friction. And either this is a very big challenge for fuzzy dark matter, or this shows that um, we still haven't understood completely uh, the dynamics uh, that happens in those systems. And the most probable cause and the most uh, the main influence is uh, the lack of variance in the in the system. So baryonic processes are going to change a lot um, the result. For example, for the dwarfs. We assume that we are probing the dark matter profile, but of course there are the variants there that we need to, to worry about. But it could also be, uh, and we see that it's true, that we also don't understand how dark matter, how fuzzy dark matter really behaves. The simulations of these models are very challenging. So if you wanna have simulations that really describe these interference patterns, the core, you need to do simulations of the Schrodinger Poisson system. You cannot simulate the hydrodynamical equations. And those are very expensive simulations. Uh, so the biggest simulation to date uh, is the one by Simon May that has around 10 megaparsec. Uh, so we really need to understand um, how dark matter behaves. So it could be that those core profiles are not universal, or even that we don't understand how the mass of the core, of the halo uh, relates to the mass of the core. So given a halo, I don't know quite well from those simulations, what will be the mass of the core. And this is something we saw in this article uh, by me and my collaborators, um, where investigated using this large simulations from Simon May, but also many simulations by Joet, um, uh, where we simulated um, fuzzy dark matter and here I, uh, I can show you the mass of the core over the mass of the halo in solar masses. And the little dots are different um, from different halos. And we can see that there's a huge uh, variability on how those two relate. And nowadays we use only one function. So we can make a mistake in the mass that we infer. 
This is only to give an example of how much uh, is not only the lack of variance in those simulations, we also still don't understand fully how these models behave. So um, I also added another, sim uh, another result here that uh, came out last week from uh, strong lensing from the interference patterns. So this is the most up-to-date um, results. So we can see that we're narrowing down the mass, but there's some incompatibility. We have to remember that there are many systematic effects that might be affecting those, um, those bounds. Uh, so we need to take this with a grain of salt. But one thing we can see is that the sweet spot for solving the small scale problems when this model was first conceived seems to be very challenged already by all these observations. So we need uh, an improvement on the observations, of course, because those small scale observations are very challenging, but we also need an improvement in the simulations. And also we need to add new types of observations and also new probes. Um, I should also say that all that I talked about here is by for the fuzzy dark matter, but the self-interacting fuzzy dark matter and the dark matter superfluid are still highly unconstrained. So there is still a lot of work to do to be done in ultralight dark matter. So the future, the future is really bright. So uh, we're going to have a huge amount of observations of um, more precise observations and especially on the small scales, as we can see here, for example, from the prime focus spectrograph, but also DESI, uh, but we also have improvements in CMB and also new windows of observation as 21 centimeters, but also as multi uh, messenger astronomy. And all of this can help improve the constraints on fuzzy dark matter. But we also need to improve simulations and new observables and new probes. For example, one new observable or one new probe that we can go after and that we start going after now, um, it is the interference patterns. Um, they are very challenging to probe, but they can be probed using strong lensing or stellar streams, which are two gravitational probes that are going to probe the existence of those granules. Or you can use heating, heating of stars to see if you see a change in the behavior of the stars due to, to the presence of this. And there has been many studies in the past few years uh, about this, um, mostly um, in the past two years, trying to see, uh, try to probe the fuzzy dark matter using um, uh, using its influence, uh, the interference of the interference patterns. Uh, because we have this uh, these simulations from Simon, uh, our group is now trying to characterize the distribution of those interference patterns because um, until now, people only use analytical models and analytical simplified models of these um, interference patterns. So we are trying to characterize them by the halos that we have in our simulation. And using this, um, with these groups, we're investigating strong lensing and stellar streams. Uh, so this is a very exciting, um, uh, uh, new way of probing uh, fuzzy dark matter. And we already have some results, um, very strong results actually. We have many results from these other articles, but I show here two very strong results. For example, this article from last week uses a strong lensing, uh, the, 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 the change that you have in strong lensing because of the interference patterns. And this one changes, uh, uses the heating caused by the interference patterns to put bounds on the fuzzy dark matter. And we can see that those are very strong bounds. So it tells us the fuzzy dark matter needs to be heavier than 10 to the minus 19 EV. So I'd say that this is an important future, um, current and future um, way of analyzing those models. And in the future, it would be also nice to use the vortices to put bounds on the mass of fuzzy dark matter. But for that, we still need to understand um, those vortices. So we need to have simulations to predict their size, their abundance, to know if they're observable and what uh, observations we can use to probe them. Um, our group and uh, other groups are also doing the same, but our group is doing simulations and trying to describe these vortices um, theoretically so we can try to uh, understand their observational signatures.
Another uh, new observable or new probe that we can have are the filaments. Uh, so the filaments seems to be seem to be very interesting um, in fuzzy dark matter. Uh, and we have to understand them. We don't understand them well because we don't have large simulations, but they seem to also have interference patterns and other uh, interesting features. Um, we, we, we had a work um, last year about the possibility of having vortices in filaments, um, and I invite you all to check. So I think filaments are also an interesting probe. Another thing that we can go after is the subgalactic power spectrum. So as I told you, here's the power spectrum over a weight number. Uh, depending on the mass of the fuzzy dark matter, um, this uh, suppression of the small scales can happen in very small scales. So as we already saw, uh, we probably don't have a very light fuzzy dark matter candidate. So we have something around 10 to the minus 19 EV, which means that this suppression is going to happen on really small scales. So we need to know, we need to learn how to probe the subgalactic power spectrum. And there has been a few attempts of that using strong lensing and stellar streams. Like for example, in uh, this, uh, this uh, works here, where in the first one, they use the substructure convergence with power spectrum. So uh, instead of using strong lensing um, to probe the perturbations, to so, so subhalos. So I'm not looking for the existence or not of small subhalos to probe um, warm dark matter and fuzzy dark matter that don't predict them. Uh, you're actually looking at a correlation function of the projected density field to construct then this um, subgalactic power spectrum. And we can see here um, on, uh, on this work by this group that they already compare, um, they already constructed the CDM and the self-interacting dark matter um, subgalactic part spectrum. And in this work here, um, they do it for fuzzy dark matter. So this is an interesting new probe um, for those models. You can also use stellar streams. Um, so uh, as done in this work by Stan Ellis and Fabio Schmidt from Max Planck, uh, where they, in this work, they have a fully analytical uh, description of the stream perturbations. So they know how the streams uh, uh, perturbations behave. So they can relate the stream power spectrum with the substructure power. So they can really probe um, the dark matter uh, behavior uh, in the subgalactic power spectrum, which is very interesting. On the simulation side, um, uh, the simulations are very challenging, as I said, um, and um, we need to really improve <laughs> on those simulations. Uh, and there ha have been many attempts in the literature and people keep trying to do hybrid simulations, something like putting together large scale and small scale, but also zoom in simulations and also uh, adding variance and many uh, different attempts. This is a big challenge, but a very necessary step to really understand the behavior of the dark matter. And on the observational side, um, uh, we are very lucky that we're going to have um, a huge amount of data, quality data from small scales that are really going to help us um, increase those constraints. I want to really quickly cite the prime focus spectroscopy spectrograph, the PFS, um, which is this spectroscopy part of the summary project. So it will be in the HSC. Uh, and this project, uh, it is a very good uh, project for probing dark matter um, because you can probe dark matter in many of those science goals. So PFS has three science goals, galaxy archaeology, cosmology, and galaxy evolution. And each of those are going to tell us a little bit about the properties of dark matter. Uh, more specifically, the Gal Gal galactic archaeology program, um, it's really strong for probing dark matter, especially this type of dark matter that have a very different behavior on small scales. Thanks for, uh, uh, thanks for this. Um, uh, dwarf uh, science uh, and also stellar stream uh, project that they, uh, the PFSGA is going to have. But we are also going to benefit a lot with future CMB missions. 
For example, CMBS4, it's going to improve the constraint on this fraction of the axion or fraction of the fuzzy dark matter in the dark sector. So we're going to improve on those constraints a lot. So we can know, we will be able to tell more precisely what is the role of the axion or of these light fields on the dark sector, not only on dark matter, but also on dark energy. Uh, like I told you, those models, they have a very different organization also. Uh, so if you have uh, new um, improvements on the measurement of the optical depth, you're going to that you're also going to have an improvement on the how you how you can constrain those models. Um, and the best way of really uh, a probe that is very sensitive to the duration of organization is the kinematic synapse of Doppler effect. Uh, so we can hope we can use this to put bounds on the fuzzy dark matter mass, especially with um, these new measurements coming from Lightboard, uh, ACT, and CMBS4. And of course, uh, those particles, if they are ultralight, so they are, they are smaller than 10 to the minus 30, they can also behave like dark energy. And we can try to probe, for example, from cosmic birefringency, which is this rotation in the measured CMB uh, polarization plane that, come, okay, that comes probably from parity violating physics in the polarization of the CMB. And this was first measured by Minami and Komatsu, but these bounds on the cosmic birefringency have been improving in the past few years. Um, and this is a really good way of also probing uh, axions. Um, but of course, there is a huge amount of uh, large-scale structure probes that are going to uh, give a much stronger statistical constraints on not only the fuzzy dark matter, but also in uh, dark matter models. And many more creative ideas. We need to create more creative ideas of and funny ways of uh, describing um, and probing those models. So I leave you here with my summary. Uh, and basically I hope I convinced you that those are well-motivated dark matter models and also models that are very, um, they have very strong phenomenology that we can probe uh, with small scale and large scale observations. The current status is that we're narrowing down um, using many different effects, many different predictions, but there's still some incompatibilities that we need to understand. And in the future and in the recent uh, progress um, is towards, uh, it's going to be huge given the new observations, but also improvements in simulations and also new probes. Thank you very much. <laughs>